Gracious and eternal God, order our steps in these days. Remind us what you require of us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before thee and never to bow to the injustices of this world. Whenever you call men and women to declare your word, you take the risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood, fill us with your spirit, that the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart might be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer. And God's people said, Amen. To the spirit of our God, to the right Reverend Andrew Dishi in his absence, a bishop, to a fellow Wayne County Goldsburyan, the Dean of the Cathedral, the Right Reverend Clifton Daniel III, to such a gracious and kind and guiding Sub-Dean and Canon for Liturgy and Arts, the Reverend Canon Patrick Malloy, to all who are here that guide worship and liturgy in this glorious place, St. John Divine National Cathedral to these three instruments of God's glory, Bishop Valerie Melvin, the Reverend Cheryl Uzzell, Miss Yara Allen, and to the organist, the Reverend Bell, Bonzo Bell, our presiding ASAP for this morning and to all of the choir leaders and members and visitors. It is good to be here this morning. Now I come from the South. I said to the Dean, I'm normally not tardy. We've been in planes, in airports, sometimes for seven hour delays, mechanical and storm. Congressman, is that my congressman? Yeah, that's him. Amen. We have been in and out of, the, amen, amen. We've been in and out of storms. We flew through a storm here. We got in late. And so down south, there's only one thing you have to say for people to say amen and give God a mighty praise. And that is, I'm a blessed man because the Lord woke me up this morning and started me on my way. Is there anybody else glad about that, that the Lord woke you up this morning? I want to press toward Pentecost. I'm going to leave it for Reverend Daniels to tell you how to make all of this work, but I want to read Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and then beginning at verse 14. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting they saw what it seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came and rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, and began to speak in new and other tongues as the Spirit enabled. Verse 14, 
Then Peter stood up with the eleven to interpret what was going on, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Follow, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is that. This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. This morning, I've been wrestling and trying to listen to God and I was real clear when you all began to sing, order my steps in your law in your in your word O oh lord we need a moral pentecost in america today the seasons and the times that we are in have had me reading over and over some specific texts in the bible that talk about what God demands of his people in relationship to the public square and political oppression. For in these days sometimes, Pastor, I have felt like one of the rappers used to say, don't push me because I'm close to the edge and I'm trying not to lose my head, trying to keep from going under. And so I've had to root myself in the word of God. I've been reading texts like Ezekiel 22 that says, your priests violate my law, desecrate my holy things, and your politicians are like wolves, prowling, killing, and rapturously taking whatever they want. And your preachers cover up for the politicians by pretending to have received visions and special revelation. And they say this is what God the master says when God hasn't said one word. And because of this, extortion is rife. Robbery is epidemic. The poor and the needy are abused. The immigrants are being kicked around with no access for justice. And I'm looking, God says, for somebody who will stand in the gap. I've been reading texts like Jeremiah 22, where God said to Jeremiah, go, here are my orders. Go down to the royal palace and deliver this message and say to those that sit in power, this is what God says. Attend to matters of justice, set things right between people, rescue victims from their exploiters, stop taking advantage of the immigrant and the homeless, the orphans and the widows, and stop using your policies to murder people. Jeremiah 22, I've been reading. Luke chapter four, verse 18, Jesus' first sermon. God's spirit is on me because he has chosen me to preach the good news to the poor, evangel to the poor, sent me to pronounce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and healing to the brokenhearted. And God has sent me to announce this is the year of God's action to accept everyone. I read John, the gospel this morning, where God tells Peter after a rough few days, I just need to know, do you love me? And if you love me, will you do something with that love? Will you feed my people? Will you help my people? Will you rescue those that are being broken and battered by the oppressive and dominating force? That's why he said, my lambs. 
because in that day, lambs were those that were killed and hurt and murdered and destroyed. But in this moment, this historical moment, I've also found myself needing to review some of the great truths spoken by the prophetic voices of other times. Have any of you had to go back in history to read what other folk went through in times worse than these in order to try to get your centering in this moment? I've had to go back and read truth, like when Dr. King once said, any religion that does not address the things that damn human souls and body is a good for nothing religion. I've had to go back and read Dorothy Day, when Dorothy Day said, we are not expecting utopia on this earth, but God meant things to be much easier than we have made them. Therefore, we must work to make things better. I found myself reading what Rabbi Heschel said in July of 1963, just before the March on Washington, Bishop Melvin. This rabbi, he wrote to a Catholic president and said to him, Mr. President, we as America forfeit the right to worship God as a nation until we do right by the Negro and we do right for the cause of justice. I found myself reading what Coretta Scott Sing, King said after her husband was brutally murdered and somebody asked her, talk to me about violence. And she said, poverty can produce a deadly form of violence. She said, let me remind you, not just somebody shooting my husband, but starving a child is violence. Suppressing a culture is violence. Neglecting school children is violence. Discrimination against working people and not allowing them to have labor rights and living wages is violence. Ghetto housing is violence. Ignoring medical needs and not allowing people to have insurance is violence. Contempt for equality is violence. And then she said, even a lack of willpower to help humanity and an apathetic spirit in the face of violence is itself violence. I found myself reading Bishop Michael Curry, God bless him, when he says being a Christian is not essentially about joining a church or being a nice person, but about following in the footsteps of Jesus, taking his teaching seriously, letting the spirit take the lead in our lives and in doing so, helping to change the world from our nightmare to God's dream. That's Bishop Curry. And I found myself reading just this evening, just last evening, Rachel Held Evans, who just passed, who died, an Episcopal priest, went in with an infection, took an antibiotic, and left here. But before she did, she said, if we want to do violence, we can always find the weapons. And if we want to be healers, we can always find the balm, B-A-L-M. But not only have I looked at scripture and I looked at these prophetic words, Pastor, I've looked at where we are. The systemic racism that we see, I'm not talking about people calling people's names, I'm talking about since 2010, 23 states have passed racist voter suppression and gerrymandering. And you know racist voter suppression is an attack on the very image of God in every person because it says you are not fully human, therefore you cannot be fully a citizen, therefore you cannot fully participate. Racism is still alive. We need a moral Pentecost. I looked at the, another form of racism, federal spending on pr prisons has increased tenfold to $7.5 billion a year since 1976, more than eightfold to 17 billion on immigration enforcement and deportation. We have more people in jail than China has, and China has a billion more people than us. Something's wrong. Racism, Latino families, brown families, torn apart, women and children caged, and now they're saying they don't even know if they can ever put some of those babies back with their family. Could you imagine that happening to some families in Manhattan? No. Racism in the church 
because sometimes the church cannot speak to racism because too much of the church is inflicted and infested with racism. We need a moral Pentecost in America. Then systemic poverty. We have seen a 60% increase in people living in poverty over the last 50 years, and yet poverty is the least talked about subject in our political discussion. Think about that. At the time that we have all of this poverty, we have less voting rights than we had 50 years ago, the things our politicians talk the least about, and even in our pulpits we talk the least about, is poverty and racism. Hmm. And over the last 50 years, while poverty has increased by 60%, the share of income lining the pockets of the top 1% has doubled, and policies that would help the poor and ensure living wages and, as a minimum wage have been slowly cut apart. There are, this morning, as we're in this grand cathedral, 140 million poor and low-wealth people. And you have Episcopal priests in Aberdeen, Washington, I know I've been there with them, in a homeless camp where it is the largest concentration of white millennials in a homeless camp with natives and other people. And they are fighting right now to keep the city from destroying the homeless camp. 140 million people living in poverty and low wealth. Might I take a moment to really get that in the, you to hear that? 52% of all our children, 39 million children, 41% of all of our seniors over 65, 21 million people, 42% of all the men in this country, 65 million, 45% of all the women in this country are poor and 74.2 million, 60% of all black people, 26 million, 64% of all Latinos, 38 million, 40% of Asians, 8 million, 58% of native, that's 2.14 million, 33% of white people, that's 66 million people, 40 million more poor and low income white people than there are black people. 62 million people working for less than $15 an hour. People who work every day and still have to live in their cars and, and, and get welfare. Even though we talk about the gross domestic product rising and Wall Street rising, but only 1% of the country has any investment in Wall Street. So what happens in Wall Street often doesn't say a thing about what's happening on the real streets of America. Oh, yes. 37 million people without health care, even with the Affordable Care Act. Despite the fact that the U.S. spends more per capita on health care than any other country. 43% of adults with health insurance struggled to pay their deductibles, and nearly 30% had a hard time affording medical bills, and 73% cut back on basic household needs and food to pay their medical bills, and medical debt is the number one cause of personal bankruptcy filing, with an estimate of 40% of Americans taking on debt because of medical issues, and 250,000 people die every year, not from cancer, not from stroke, not from heart attacks, but from poverty. Before we leave this two-hour service, 56 people will have died. Not because God called them home, but because of what Jeremiah said, murderous policy. I'm from the South where so many politicians claim to follow God and love the Bible, and yet most of them vote against policies that would deter racism and poverty. The real emergency is in the 13 former Confederate states. 52.7 .7 million people are poor and low income. 52.7 million. 13 million without insured, and most of the politicians below the Mason-Dixon line from Virginia to Alabama vote against programs that would help the poor and then go to church and say, I love Jesus. One third of all the poor whites live in the South. One third of all the poor people live in the South. What we have seen says Paul Bowden, director of the Western Regional Advocacy Project, 
We've seen cuts in federal housing assistance and affordable subsidized housing since the 1970s. If Jesus were alive today and Mary was pregnant and trying to go somewhere, he probably would once again hear, there's no room in the end. The majority of homeless families are headed by single women with young children, over half a million of them. LGBTQ gay young people represent 5 to 10 percent of the nation, but nearly 40 percent of the homeless in this country. In two, 2015, a survey found that, that an estimated 2.5 to 3.5 million people sleep in shelters every night or encampments while people are telling us everything is all right. The Dow Jones is rising. 7.4 million people are on the brink of homelessness. One $400 bill would put them on the street. And what are we doing in the midst of this, in this time? Out of every dollar, federal discretionary dollar, nearly 60 cents is going to the military and we can already blow the world up 50 times. It seems like once would be enough. And we're only spending 15 cents of every discretionary dollar on education and health care and poverty programs. And yet, we are told we don't have the money. There's a scarcity. We need a moral Pentecost. And watch what happened this week. If you don't think that we need a moral Pentecost, on the same day that the president had a contrived national day of prayer, on the same day, they filed the court documents to get rid of health care, to end totally the Medicaid expansion and the rules that say insurance companies must cover pregnant women and cover persons with pre-existing conditions. Praying in the Rose Garden, P-R-A-Y-I-N-G. Praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G on pregnant women and sick folk in the back rooms of the administrative offices. And I thought about that as I was doing a college commencement yesterday. I met a young man at that commencement who had cancer and almost died before graduation. And what saved him? The fact that insurance companies could not deny him insurance. On, on, yesterday, before I could get to the hotel, Reverend McKinnon and I were there, and a father comes up and says, pray for me at baggage claim. He says, both my daughters have breast cancer. Both of them, 121, 124, both of them, breast cancer, one stage four. Under this new push to end insurance, insurance companies would not be required to cover these two young people. And if it goes through and those babies die, we don't need to have a funeral saying God called them to himself. We need to have a funeral bring every TV camera and say, this is what policy murder looks like. We need a moral Pentecost. And my brothers and sisters, when I read that biblical text and hear and rehear the words of prophetic voices and research the stats and then travel this country and look in the eyes and the faces of those who had suffered, and then I look at this text from Acts and it reminds me again and again that people of faith must comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We must have a voice and a place in the public square and anything less than this biblical witness that quarrels and takes issues with the world's injustice is a heretical attempt to hijack the faith and use it in the service of domination and oppression. It is an abdication of the basic responsibility of faith. It seems to me in a deep place that the moral crisis we face demands that we need, we must have a moral and political Pentecost in America today that calls us out of our rooms of hiding, our places of isolations, our quarantine sanctuaries into the public square. Just like in the days of the New Testament when narcissism and lying was on the throne, the people impacted were in a room hiding. They were in a room hiding. That's why they were on one accord, because they were all messed up. They were all afraid. Caesar was saying, I and I alone can save you. Caesar put his picture on the money and the building. Caesar, Caesar had killed 
the Messiah. And though the Messiah had resurrected, the Messiah has now lifted on the cloud and they are left here. And then Pentecost came and called them, drew them out of their upper room into the public square. It was the only hope for the times they lived in. What happened, what happened that day? Well, the first thing is they received a new fire. Fire sat on the head of every one of them, male and female, gay and straight in the room. This is theophany, when fire of, represents God showing you things in spiritual illumination. And we need the fresh fire of illumination today. We need to hear what Peter, Peter said, look, this is that. He interpreted it. illumination. What you're seeing, this is that. And we need that today. We need to understand what's going on. This is that. That's why writing for the New York Times, Princeton historian Nail Irvin Painter was saying this is that when she responded to her frustration with so many people saying that the moment we're in in this nation is totally new. With prophetic illumination, she says, nope. Mm -mm. The pattern we're seeing and witnessing is called call and response. She said it is the iconography of a tragic, traditionally American call and response. The call, a challenge to the status quo, and then the response is outbreaks of meanness, vileness, rhetorical weapons, even murderous physical attacks. She said you can see it in the bloody history of lynching with its festive mobs and souvenir postcards and body parts that were all used as a way of trying to put back freedom back in slavery. She says, no, this is that. What we're seeing in America now is not strange to America. It is all too America. It is all too America. It was there in the emergence of what we call the Second Reconstruction during the Civil Rights Movement. People came together, people came together, and then some 50 years ago, greedy people decided the only way to control America to some degree was to combine a limited immoral agenda with an intentional racist strategy to intentionally divide black and white poor people in the South so that they could control the politics. Southern wealthy segregationists decided on the plan, and they used Richard Nixon to implement the plan. It was called the Southern Strategy, but he called it law and order. His advisor, Kevin Phillips, said, look, if we can figure out who hates who and play them against one another, we can control the country. The plan, that, that plan brought us where we are now. It had been operative for 50 years. In the 19th century, following the Civil War, fusion coalitions came together throughout the South to reconstruct the nation as, the, as a republic that would in fact guarantee liberty and justice and all. Black and white ministers Fusion ministers, prophetic leaders came together, rewrote constitutions all over the South. But this radical democratic call evoked a violent backlash that Nell Painter talks about. We need to be illuminated and understand this is that. What we're seeing now is that that we have already seen. In the 19th century, there was the outbreak of the Klan. And the Klan first attacked white people to, uh, to, to push them away from black people. And then there was this movement called the redemption movement. If you go back and read the language of that movement in the 19th century that, that tried to overturn and did overturn Reconstruction, all through the liturgy it says our goal is to make America great again. Dr. King talked about it in 1965. He warned us at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March campaign. He says, listen, they, this is what happened, and this is what always happened. They segregated Southern money from poor whites. They segregated Southern moors from rich whites. They segregated Southern churches from Christianity. They segregated Southern minds from honest thinking, and they segregated the Negro from everything. That's what happened when the Negro and the white poor masses of the South threatened to unite and build a great society, a society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others, a society of plenty, where we would build the beloved communities. What we are seeing now, this is that. And we need the fire of a moral Pentecost that will help us understand this history. We must have the kind of political and moral Pentecost that helps us see how, 
clearly how these demons that shape our present reality are old and entrenched. I thought I could use the word demon since I saw you all also using smoke at the beginning of. Because you don't use holy smoke if you don't believe in ugly demons. You really don't. You, you don't bring in the smoke as the as the, as the as the as the as the image of the prayers going up into heaven. No need to pray if there's no evil in the world. And so we need to know that the package may be different, but the content is the same. Then we need a moral Pentecost because on Pentecost they spoke in another tongue. They came out of hiding. They faced oppression of their day with new tongues. We need a moral Pentecost in America to get our language right. We have inherited a language that is too puny for the crisis we face. Somewhere, somehow, probably many of you in here call yourselves left. <laughs> and then we call other people right. First of all, the left-right language comes from the French Revolution. The left didn't like the monarchy, the right like the monarchy. We are not in the 17th century. These terms have been passed down to us, but the language left versus right, liberal versus conservative, is too puny to the challenges of extremism that we're facing now. We need a deeper language, a new tongue, a moral language to name this crisis. We've got to learn how to speak in tongues if we're going to challenge the lies of this season. This is no time for polite... Con This is no time for polite conversation about alternative facts and giving equal moral standing to policies that are not equally morally. We need moral clarity. Our faith teaches some basic truths and we must speak from those truths. Everybody is created in the imago dei, the image of God. So any policy that is against it, it's not left or right, it's just bad. It's heretical. God is especially concerned about the poor. There are 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that talk about the poor, the poor, the poor, the immigrant, the needy, the women, and the children. That's why we cannot let somebody high like, hijack the moral conversation and say, I'm on the right because I'm against gay people, I'm for prayer in the school, I'm against a woman's right to choose, I'm for guns, for tax cuts, and for hating Muslims. Well, you might be on the right, but it's the right side of hell. It ain't the right side of heaven. It's wrong. It has no place in the scriptures where we are commanded by him who died, got up and rose on the third day morning, shall come back again, who said, by this love all men shall know that you are my disciples. Our deep faith and religious values require that we do not be silent. We got to speak with tongues, new tongues, because silence is betrayal in this moment. Like G the king said, we must speak not from the left or the right, but the moral faith center. It's wrong is what we must say. It's immoral, it's unjust to take health care away from 20 million Americans. It ain't left or right, it's just wrong. It's wrong to blame our economic challenges on poor people and immigrants and people of color while we give welfare to corporations and socialism to corporations, but we give individualistic capitalism to the poor. It's wrong. It's just wrong to scapegoat Muslim immigrants for violence perpetrated many times by American foreign policy. It's wrong to nominate a man who knows nothing about housing to lead an agency he didn't believe in a housing. It's wrong. It's wrong to put an attorney general in place, either one of them charged with protecting voting rights and they don't even believe in voting rights and refuse to uphold the very constitution they swore. It's wrong to only talk about the wealthy and the middle class when there's 140 million people languishing in poverty and low wealth in this country. It's just wrong. 
It's wrong to get up and lie on gay people and say, well, you know, because of gay people, Sodom and Gomorrah fell. That's a lie. Ezekiel 16, verse 40 and following says that Sodom and Gomorrah fell because Sodom and Gomorrah refused to take care of the poor and the needy and those who were left out. That's why Sodom and Gomorrah fell. And that's why this nation could fall. And lastly, on Pentecost, the sons and the daughters prophesied. Did y'all hear that? It said, your sons and your daughters prophesied. There is a new prophetic togetherness. And we need this moral political Pentecost today. The people in the upper room were among the dejected and the rejected. But when Pentecost came, they come out the closet. They are no longer afraid. They're no longer bound. They're no longer contained. Ah, they come out with a new unified proclamation right in the face of the empire. And we need this kind of moral Pentecost today to give us courage to come out of the rooms of hiding. Where we need a place where the rejected and the de dejected come together to proclaim a new way and save the heart and soul of this nation and perhaps this world. One of my favorite passages of scripture is where it says the stones that the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. In other words, God can use the dejected and the rejected to produce a revival. Those 120 in that upper room, men and women, were dejected and rejected. When the Spirit came, they became the leaders of a new revival right in the face of Caesar and all of his narcissism. And I know that in this room, there are some who've known rejection. If I was home, I'd say, do I have a witness? Huh? Some of you known rejection because of your sexuality, rejection because of who you love, rejection because of how you were born, rejection because somebody needed somebody to hate to try to feel good about themselves. There are folk in this room that have known rejection, rejection because of your income, rejection because of your faith, rejection because of your race, rejection because of your lack of faith, rejection because somebody decided in their own ideology that they had a right, a false mandate to demean your humanity and my humanity given to us only by God. You felt rejection. Reject it because right now you're broken. A child has broken your heart or you've lost a child or, or the, you're worried about insurance and your loved ones and where they're going to go. Reject it. But I want you to know that I believe God is sending a new moral Pentecost where the stones that the builders of re, that have been rejected will become the cornerstone of a new moral movement in this experience called America. I've been traveling all over the country, Pastor, with Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, my co-chair in the Poor People's Campaign, and something is happening. Just this past week, I was in rural Kentucky, white and black folk in rural Kentucky getting together. In rural Kentucky, something's happening. I've seen white women from West Virginia hooking up now with black women from Alabama. Something's happening. A few weeks ago, I, I, we had a Jewish Seder in a, in, a, in, a, in a Muslim mosque with me as a Christian pop Pentecostal preacher preaching. Something's happening. Something's happening. Something's happening. This past Wednesday in North Carolina, nearly 20,000 people marched on Wild Raleigh. Black, white, Asian, native, brown, teachers, teachers. But they said, we're not just going to march for teacher pay. We're going to march for Medicaid expansion, 15 and a union. And I heard the teachers say, I'm here because the spirit of the Lord is calling us together. I want you to know that, that, that Pentecost, Pentecost is when the rejected get together. When, listen, the sons and daughters prophesy. And when they did 2,000 years ago, they shook things up in the empire. It got so, got so revived that 3,000 joined on one day. It got so, so, so different and so revived that when they came into town, folks said, oh, Lord, here are those folk coming who turned the world upside down, and they were really turning it right side up. We need a moral Pentecost because with the moral Pentecost, we can, in fact, redeem America from hate and discrimination. I want you to know that when in the spirit of the Lord, 
and in the spirit of, the, of love, hands that once picked cotton can join Latino hands and join progressive white hands and join faith hands and join labor hands and join Asian hands and join Native American hands and join poor hands and join wealthy hands with a conscience and join gay hands and join straight hands and join trans hands, Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands. And when all those hands get together, Pentecost! Yeah, God, my Father. When the rejected join hands and go in the public square and dare to speak prophetic truth, our togetherness becomes an instrument of redemption. When we get out of the sanct, come to the sanctuary on Sunday morning only to get in the street on Monday morning, Pentecost. If the sons and the daughters will move by the Spirit in a new togetherness, we must have a moral Pentecost, especially those of us who claim Jesus as Lord. We have no excuse. We together in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the public square and in the pulpit, we must speak love over hate. We must speak truth over lies. We must speak mercy over meanness, grace over greed, unity over division, liberation over oppression, justice over injustice. Yes, we need a moral Pentecost. I know I'm at the cathedral, but turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, we we need a moral Pentecost. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Melt us and mold us. Fill us, oh God. Spirit of the living God, oh God, fall fresh on us. We must have a moral Pentecost. Without it, without it, America is in bigger trouble than any party, than any political system. The soul and our heart is, is in trouble without a moral Pentecost. In the early 20th century, the social gospel movement looked at poverty and the lack of wages and health care, and they sang, the voice of God is calling. It summons in our day, Isaiah heard in Zion, and we now hear God say, whom shall I send to secure my people in their need? Whom shall I send to loosen the bond of shame and greed? In the early 20th century, they said, I hear my people crying in slum in mind and meal, no field or mart is silent, no street is still. I see my people falling in darkness and despair. Whom shall I send to shatter the feathers which they bear? They knew then what we must know now. Only a movement with power from on high can break through the power of evil and injustice. All through history, at various times, we've needed a moral Pentecost. Abolition was a moral Pentecost against slavery. Women's suffrage was a moral Pentecost against slavery. The Civil Rights Movement was a kind of moral Pentecost. When the, son, the Spirit brought the rejected sons and the rejected daughters out in the public in order to lift the nation up from the lowlands of sin and injustice and degradation. And we need it again. I tell you from this sacred pulpit as I go to my seat, America needs more than a strategy to win back some seats for the Democrats or hold on to some seats for the Republicans. We need a long-term plan for a moral movement that links up and fights together for a moral agenda. That's why I'm involved with the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, because I believe the spirit is at work among the dejected and the rejected of this land. And back home, in my church, when I was a boy, and stuff got tough, stuff got hard, and stuff got rough, but people knew that we, they were not going to suddenly be beamed out into heaven. You know, they weren't going to suddenly be able to just leave. They would have to stay here and do something. Somebody would recognize that moment and that we needed to do more than just ask God to fix things. We needed to join God's work, but we could only do what was needed to be done with a strength that comes from God's spirit. So somebody would sing, Reverend Bell, send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. We need a moral Pentecost 
this power again in America. We need the power that gives us the courage to speak truth to power. So let me join with my ancestors. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. We've seen resurrection. Now let us see manifestation. The rejected must revive and make sure that the promises of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law and care for the common good will never be taken away or forfeited for anybody, anytime, anywhere. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. We will make sure that hope, not hate, has the last word in the state house, in the White House, and even in the church hour. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. I come by to announce to you that this is not the era of Trump. This is the era of the Holy Ghost. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Together, we will ensure that all of God's children are respected and treated with dignity. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. Together, the rejected will redeem the heart of America, and we will make sure that this nation lives out its promise to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. And I know I've been longer than usual, and I know how to be easy, ecclesiastically in order, but I want to know are there a few folk, because I'm following the Spirit now, that'll just leave your pew and walk down to the altar with your hands up and say, Lord, send it on down. Come on, come on. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Loose your spirit, Lord. Loose your power, Lord. Loose your love, Lord. Huh? Loose, yeah, Loose your justice, Lord. Loose your mercy, Lord. We need it, God. Give us power. Give us power. It doesn't have to be like this. Give us power. It doesn't have to be like this. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost. God, help us in this moment to be open to the power of your spirit and never believe that hate and hurt and hell and oppression and opposition and honoriness is more powerful than you. Fill us, Lord. Fill us all over this nation. Let the rejected and the dejected have a new fire, a new tongue. Help us to be the ones to face this that is that. Let us fulfill your word. Send it on down, Lord. Send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost send it on down. Use us for your glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name and believe it done.